Hi everybody, this is the Cricket Badger radio show podcast. Each badger marks the track with its own scent. His black legs are short but very powerful for digging. In fact, the name badger probably comes from the French word bêche, meaning digger. It's that badger style. It's an exciting week this week. We've got three cracking guests. Rob Keogh answers the cricket badger quick questions. We talked to Lewis Hatchett, the former Sussex bowler, about his struggles through a six-year career through the pain barrier and what he's done to motivate others since his retirement. And we speak to Ian Butcher, former Leicestershire and Gloucestershire batsman, about a very interesting project he's involved in near the Grenfell Tower tragedy of last summer, just underneath the flyover. They are building cricket in the inner cities, looking to raise money for a really exciting project there. And we'll talk to Ian all about that, all this week on the Cricket Badger radio show podcast. It's that Badger style. First up then, Ian Butcher this week, talking about a really exciting project he's involved in. I won't tell you any more. Let's hear from him. Now on the Cricket Badger Radio Show, a pleasure to introduce uh, Ian Butcher, former Gloucestershire, Leicestershire batsman, obviously a famous surname. Ian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, James. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me on. You, you sent me a video the other day, which seemed to strike a chord with me. It's a, a fantastic little project you've got going down there in London. I think the video is under the flyover or something like that. But basically, you've got a, a setup down there under the A40, all of the, the busy roads going a, above you, um, and a little bit of an oasis of cricket happening, and you're trying to raise a bit of money to expand that. Absolutely. It's it's sort of a little, um, as you say, a little oasis, but it not not in the, uh, the, the the way that most people would consider a, an oasis. It is, uh, it is a very urban, urban setting, uh, which doesn't always sort of fit in with uh, people's image of, uh, of the game of cricket. But it, it, it came to my attention. Someone told me about a, um, a two-lane sort of cricket centre that was right underneath a flyover, as you say, coming out of uh, Shepherd's Bush into into centre, central central London. And I went to have a look at it. And it, it, it was just very, uh, very urban, um, needed one or two little things looking at. And one of them was the uh, was the tunnel idea that we uh, came up with, uh, the retractable tunnel to enclose it so it can be used during the sort of autumn winter months when normally it's uh, pretty pretty redundant but it's uh, yeah it's a very exciting very exciting project and uh, with the funding at the moment we're going out to various uh, various organizations to see whether we get some uh, funding to to help it uh, along its way this is a, a the Westway sports center and the, the the video shows that it's a it's a nice little setup um, down there in London but under the A40, the, the cars streaming across the top of you. There's a little two-lane cricket net there, which is open a bit to the elements. There's a you can see from the video that the the sun shines, the the wind maybe blows yeah. a little bit, but <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a cracking little place to to play cricket and to learn the game. But what what you're looking to do there is to get a a retractable tunnel, isn't it? To so you can basically kind of yeah. run it on, run it off, and, and cover that net. Yeah, it's very similar to um, people. People obviously are listening to this will will know the Premier League football uh, setups where the where the players walk on and, and and off the pitch. So it'll be a very very similar thing to that. It it, uh, it will be lit for for the winter months and and the evenings. But it's a very simple project um, as far as the mechanical side of things. And um, and as as you say from the video, you can see that the, the sun. When I first went to see it, the sun was a major problem. I, I think it was around about October November I went to see it. So that winter sun was was very low and it was a major problem with ball sort of traveling through through light dark light dark and becomes a bit of a problem for batters so that was something that we had to had to look at and try and overcome as cheaply as we possibly can be because this will this will be you know very much a community project and we're going to try and make it as affordable as we possibly can so so the actual structure the actual project had to sort of remain within that remit as well so it was it was a very good uh, Stuart canvas with a company that came up with the idea and uh, we're, we're going to sort of run with that and it looks to be um, 
looks to be a winner at the moment. We're going to tweet out the the video on the at cricket underscore badger Twitter feed um, and try and help you kind okay. of cover, cover this Thank as you. much as possible. But uh, if if anybody kind of the nitty gritty of this, if anybody wants to get involved in this project and wants to to help you out, whether it's financial or, or whatever, how do they get in touch with you and how do they help? Right, well they can get in touch with me on ipbutch at aol dot com. That is my uh, my website. They can go to my uh, my cricket coaching website, which is www.butchforcricket.com. Dot com. There they'll they'll get a little bit of background on on me as well, and all my other contact details will be on there. So that that is something that they can come back to. Um, we're looking for, as I say, we're looking for funding for the whole project. But I also think that that one or two people might like to get involved from a charitable the, the charitable side of it when they when they have a look, because this this centre is actually right in the right in the shadow of the Grenfell Tower. So obviously the tragedy that occurred there last summer is very, still very much in people's uh, people's minds, um, and the local community obviously. Need 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 some help, whether that be financial, whether that be somewhere for the kids to come and play. Doesn't matter what sport it is, because the the centre just caters for so many sports there. Um, and it would just be an ideal opportunity to offer cricket to to maybe people that haven't uh, haven't seen the game before, haven't played the game before at uh, at, a, at, a, at something which is very affordable, or even coming in from the from the local schools. So yeah, some somewhere in that region of about eighty to ninety thousand is what we're what we're looking to to raise. Hopefully, as I say, the bulk of that will come from uh, from funding um, from from various organisations who are sort of renowned for for that that type of uh, that type of thing. So you know, fingers crossed. And as I say, if anybody wants to get in contact with me, those numbers and and uh, uh, email addresses are there, and it'll be it'll be great to hear from you. And your your website is www butch4 and that's the four, number 4 yeah, number cricket. 4 cricket.com that's it and uh and it will it will everything everything sort of about about myself and 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 about what I do from a coaching perspective it is on there um, and as I say, all the contact details are there at the uh, at the end as well. It's, in the, it's a little bit of um, the, the site has just been changed a little bit to reflect what's going on, especially with this project and one or two other things that I've got going on. But uh, the, the contact details will still be up there. It's, it's, it's a cracking little project, I think. I mean, anybody Thank that watches you. the video, you can't help but kind of think, well, yeah, that, that looks like a really good little initiative there. And obviously, you just mentioned the Grenfell Tower tragedy there. Mm-hmm. Kind of the ingredients were all there to, for a really nice little you know, success story coming underneath the, the road around that that area Absolutely. and one, one of the things that did strike me as well but when i was watching that video was you can you can play cricket almost anywhere can't you i mean I, i've seen pictures of people playing in in very strange places obviously people go off and get sponsored playing on underneath everest and all those kind of things but yeah, basically yeah. you can pick up a bat and a ball and and learn the game of cricket pretty much anywhere and if you can find a little corner and get going you can you can, you can learn the game anywhere you want Anywhere, absolutely anywhere. I mean, I, I've been to some, I've been to some far-flung places uh, coaching. I, I spent five weeks out in Rwanda um, in 2012, which was which, which was an amazing experience. And at the time, they only had one ground. And then through a, through again through the Rwandan Cricket uh, Foundation, they managed now to to build a purpose-built international cricket ground, which is which is only just in the last three months got uh, got up and running. Um, but when I was there, there was literally one net and one cricket ground in the whole country. And it, you know that that was an amazing experience. I've been out to places like the Falkland Islands, which is a little bit on the windy side, but you can still play there. Um, and Chile, I've been out to uh, been out to Santiago and, and and coached out there. So you know the, the, the cricket is cricket is played in all sorts of different places in all sorts of different countries. And and I think it's I think it's amazing how talent there is out there, uh, even even in in countries where you know people people aren't aren't subjected to the to the game in in any way, shape or form. So. So, uh, yeah, you're right. It, it is it is certainly, and it, and it's and it's affordable. You know, it, it, you, you don't have to have a brand new bat. You can just take a bat out, any sort of tennis ball, and you can you can have a game. So uh, you know, it's all it's almost like uh, football's equivalent to jumpers for goalposts. So it's um no, it's it's, it's very uh, very achievable. I, I often think with any any sport, it's it's all about opportunity, isn't it? And the you, you can have a guy walking around the streets who. Is a potential Wimbledon tennis champion, but because he never ever picks up a tennis racket, never gets to do that. And it's yeah. it's about putting a bat in people's hands and giving them that opportunity to play the game and see how far they can take it. Absolutely, and and you know anybody that's involved in sport, doesn't matter doesn't matter what it is or even watches, they, they, we all know the percentages. The percentages are very low, but you know that that diamond can be unearthed, you know, very easily if you if if the tentacles go out go out far enough. Um, and and I'm sure that those those places, and I'm sure that even even the Westway, you know, that small little cent po- uh, pocket of London, 
could unearth someone who's never ever watched a game, seen a ball bowl, hit a ball, bowled a ball. I'm, I'm sure there is the, 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 there's someone lurking in there, whether it be male or female, um, who is who is ready to be ready to be unearthed, if you like. Watching the video and and, and hearing about your project, yeah, as I say, I think it's uh, it's a very exciting little in, in, initiative. But what what struck me is it's something that could happen pretty much anywhere. You know, around the country, we've got lots of um, cities, lots of areas of yeah. You, you walk around most towns and stuff. There's kind of areas of wasteland and there's there's, there's places that are underutilized that that setup the kind of sticking two nets maybe having a, a retractable net over the top of it could happen anywhere it could do yeah ab- ab- absolutely and 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 in many ways you know you, you've got sports centers dotted all over the country that that may have may have two outdoor cricket lanes and by by sort of definition of, of, of our winter you um, they remain sort of unused during those sort of six seven months now there's there's nothing to say that you can't put this this system over any any netting it doesn't have to be in a in a completely urban area like this one it's, you, could, you could just cover it up retract it during the summer put it over the uh, over the nets during the winter and you've got your own indoor facility you know you could you can light it um, and and it, as you say it, it, it is something that can be can be rolled out literally all over all over the country um so it, there are opportunities there for for people who as i say all, all over the place who haven't been uh, haven't been open to the game that, that it could be that uh, be that thing that gets them gets their minds whirring and gets them looking at the game as, as something which which is possibly for them If you're following the Cricket Badger Twitter feed, at Cricket underscore Badger, you'll know that we've been running a series of polls to select the greatest ever, or firstly, England cricketer. Congratulations, Ian Botham. Pakistan cricketer. Congratulations, Imran Khan. And we're getting towards the closing stages of picking the greatest Australian cricketer ever. Have your vote. Make it count. At Cricket underscore Badger. Moving on to, to to you as a as a coach and you as a as a former player, I, I spoke to you when I was writing my book, uh, following yep. on in the footsteps of cricketing fathers. Obviously, your father, uh, sorry, your, your brother Alan played for England, yeah. played for Surrey. His son Mark um, played for England, played for Surrey. But it doesn't end there, does it? You know, you, you've got a, a whole family of butchers who have uh, taken a lot from cricket. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my my middle brother at the time. By the way, I love the fact you call my older brother my daddy. I love that. So <laughs> he, he often get, he often gets referred to as my dad, and I I do have a little uh, little smirk at that one. Uh, well, yeah, I, hopefully, middle... hopefully Alan doesn't listen to this. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll 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 let him have a listen to it. Put it that way. He, he won't uh, <laughs> it, it won't go amiss. Um, so I've um, yeah, my middle brother Martin was was on the MCC ground staff for uh, for three years. So he he was in, and he played. Uh, Play one first class game, and then uh, uh, Alan's younger brother Gary. Uh, he was on the um, Morgan and Surrey staff and won a couple of championship winners' medals as well. Um, and he got first class hat trick. So yeah, so the, um, the it, it does run through through the family, and it's 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 often sort of we, we we've often asked where did it come from, and, and to this day we still don't know where that where that sudden spark uh, arrived. But it uh, it certainly certainly hit quite hard, I think. <laughs> uh, in my book, so I speak to Alan, I speak to Mark about their their relationship. And how they, you know, Alan helped out Mark when he was having a, a bad run of form there. But yeah. one, one of the things I think that kind of I, I came to the conclusion with families in cricket was that yeah, you know, that word opportunity is 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 very key to a lot of sports people. And obviously, when you when you're growing up in a family where everybody else is pretty much playing the sport, you get that opportunity pretty much forced upon you. So you, from a very early age, you've got a cricket bat in your hand, you're playing that game, and I think that's that's. Where a lot of the families in cricket come from, I, I think so. Yeah, I, I think I think in particular, I think in particular cricket as well. That um, if you look at it as a as a as a team game, I think that if you are if if you see it as a as a, as a young young kid, either with an elder brother, or a father, an uncle, or whatever, if you if you're sort of taken along to games or you're sat in front of the television to watch it, I think that I, I think the sort of the bug can strike that way. I think football is a game that that, that is. We're, we're just saturated by it every every minute of the day that, that you don't necessarily have to come from a football loving family or football playing family to sort of be able to see it be able to see it played and think I'll have a go at that whereas cricket I think is 
is is a little bit is a little bit a um, little bit more difficult than that. But as I say, if you have if you have uh, family members who play it, then it tends to be that it it it, it does does run in run in families that way definitely and and ours certainly did and i think i mentioned on the video that having two elder brothers that played the game you know unless i wanted to go off and do something on my own then then that's what i wanted to do and it just so happened that i i i, I love the game as well so that worked out worked out quite well we all know what the dynamics of uh, the families are and yeah as well as playing that uh, playing sport it's a very competitive environment and I, I guess there's a lot of rivalry as well between yourself and your brothers and trying to get one over on each other as well well the, uh, myself and alan certainly played against each other i think on a couple of occasions and that that was uh, that was quite interesting there was some uh, some interesting banter going on from the slips and whatever um especially that that uh, day against surrey at uh, grace row when i was playing in a game and i managed just to get a little tiny nick on one against sylvester clark and Probably for the first time in my life, I didn't walk, and I did wonder why a Sylvester steamed in for the next ball. But I was, <laughs> I was getting a lot of uh, a lot of stick from my uh, from my brother at second slip, yeah, which obviously remains remains uh, unrepeatable. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, 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 during those times, there was a lot of competition. Other than that, you know, I, I don't think we ever sort of we ever got on the phone to each other and say, you know, how many did you get today, or how many did you get? And I don't think it ever sort of got to that point. But um, I think we were very supportive of each other. And, and and wanted wanted everybody to do well. Then obviously when Mark and Gary came into the first class game as well, the same the same thing applied to them. So um, well, the, the flip side right. of the the rivalry is that you inspire each other as well, and that you push each other on. Definitely, yeah, and I think that is that is the case. And you know, and and I think that even from when I finished playing and then went into the went into the sort of coaching game. And actually, funnily enough, when when we mentioned Grenfell earlier on, when I finished playing county cricket, I was I became a firefighter. I was a firefighter for about fifteen years. So that. That, that whole thing is almost sort of going going round in a cycle. That you know you hear about the you hear about the sort of traumatic um, scenes that the firefighters had to put up with that day. And I, I've got a sort of a, a small inkling. Obviously, never fought anything that big, but have a small inkling of of, of what that was like. And um, so so yeah, that 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 support system and was 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 certainly there. So when when Mark's burst into the, the onto the scene with the England England set up, you know, I was, uh, I was very very supportive of him, and it was nice when people were sort of coming up to me and saying, you know, Mark's doing really well and it's a sort of sense of pride that it, it sort of runs in the, runs in the family, yeah, very much so. That's quite a transition from being a, a professional sportsman to a, to a firefighter, isn't it? I, I often think with cricketers that they, you, you, you come through as a, as a youngster, you, you probably, all you ever know is cricket. You know, for you, leaving cricket and then jumping into the world of firefighting, it kind of, you, you're exposed to the, the real world very quickly, aren't you there? Yeah. Yeah, and and I think I think the other side of it was that that a lot of people actually when they finish playing the game they struggle with that lack of camaraderie with the, with whatever yeah. whatever career they choose to go into afterwards, and that becomes a real problem for some, not just cricketers but but sportsmen as well. I think it's been pretty well documented. But what I did there was was I went from a changing room into a locker room, and so that 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 the actual playing of the game I think I, I've been doing it for so many years that I think my body and brain needed a rest from it. Um, um, but that whole changing room, locker room atmosphere was still there, and I think that was that was very important to me. So, so that that change was 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 a little sort of a little bit more uh, seamless than, than maybe some others who have gone through you know one or two little problems in trying to adapt to a different uh, different career. So that that was that was very useful for me. You made me laugh a bit when you mentioned that uh, nicking Sylvester Clark <laughs> in that match against Surrey, because most people when they nick Sylvester Clark, they used to walk off very quickly, didn't they? <laughs> well, I had about three overs to go with the rest of, uh, for, to, to the end of the day and that was my job to protect people like David Gower and whatever from coming in next against him and uh, it, they they probably didn't care how quickly I got out the next day to get Gower in but uh, that, that, was, <laughs> that just happened to my happened to be my job that night and for some reason I don't know I don't know what it was but I, I decided that I was going to stay and it was uh, it was quite funny Silver's gave me some stick and, and, and myself and Alan still talk about it now yeah but I, I do I do question my sanity when I look back at that decision <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that the book males there with the the, the success of uh, yourself and Alan and, and Mark and Gary etc but uh, um, Alan's uh, daughter Bryony also played as well and I guess one of the things with your 
current coaching thing is that you, you you're not just coaching young young boys you're coaching young girls as well these days absolutely i, I, I have a role at the uh, the herodian school which is just down uh, down the road for me in barnes and um it would it would seem that the vast majority of of, of the schools around this area especially now uh, going away from rounders it's come out of the girls uh, sports curriculum and going to going to girls cricket so i think on the on the um on the back of the the, the world cup win during the summer with the England ladies, I think the, that that is beginning to, to take off, or if not, has already taken off, and so that that leads to a lot of opportunities for for girls to start playing and getting involved in clubs. and And one of the things that that, that is needed is, is more female coaches as well. It comes a point where you know that the girls, I think, need those role models, and you know that 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 would be something which I would I'd like to be able to help and and run some. And this would come out of the Westway Centre as well, run some coach the coaches type sessions so that. So we can get some females in to, to help boost the numbers so that the girls have got something that they, they sort of recognise and feel comfortable with as they start getting into their sort of first early teens. It's been a massive year for, for women's cricket in England, particularly with, as you mentioned, the World Cup win. Obviously, the Ashes, they, they didn't necessarily win the Ashes, but they fought mm-hmm. back and, and got the draw down under uh, and won the, the team award at the Sports Personality of the Year. So, you know, you, when you mention role models, there is a lot of inspiration there for young kids coming through, young girls coming through. Without, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. And, you know, I think when you when you look at when you look at the crowd on that final day at uh, Lords, it just goes to show how 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 big it's become. It's become a professional sport now, quite rightly. And I, and I think throughout the schools, I think that they're beginning to recognise that this this could be a career path. You know, not everybody that goes to school these days is 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 academic, and and some of them are very sporty. And I think for for the girls to have have an outlet to to actually think to themselves, hang on a minute, I I could I could make this my living. Um, I think it's very important, and I think that will that will attract a lot of a lot of people. But it is just the game itself the game is is it sort of lends itself to to teamwork it lends itself to that camaraderie that i mentioned earlier on um and and, and i think that I, th- I think that it could it, it could become bigger not just at the professional game because we we can't forget that that sort of 99.9 percent of any game is played at a non-professional level and and but it, it, it can become it can become a sort of source for a lot of friendships uh, social side is is very good so yeah I, I i think it can only go from uh, strength to strength going back to your, your westway project then just give mm-hmm. the listeners a reminder of uh, the way to contact you to help out with that yeah so if you go to ipbutch at aol.com um that will give you that will give you direct obviously into my website you can contact me through there um, also, if you go to um, www.butchforcricket.com as well, that will go to my website. My other contact details will be on, on on that. And then, if you're interested in helping us along with 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 anything really, I mean, any any ideas that you may have. But obviously, before we can get the thing going, we need to we need to raise the funds to to build this retractable tunnel. Um, and once that once that happens, then you know we, we could be sort of on the in on the begin or in the beginning of uh, of something something quite uh, quite quite special down there. So it's an amazing setup, caters for all sorts of sport. It's a great opportunity for when mums bring their kids down. They can go and have a cup of coffee in the cafe there. They can go and do some spinning classes. They can there's all sorts of things that they can combine while their while their kids are being taught by uh, some you know some really good coaches that I'm hoping to get down there and run some special courses during the summer. Um, so yeah, it could be a it could be a hive of activity on the cricket front down there once once that uh, once that funding has been been raised. It'd be, it'd be an exciting day, I guess, for you when you when you press the button or you pull out that retractable tunnel for the first time. Oh no, I'll get somebody else to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned to me when we uh, when, when we spoke um, before about your desire to get the butchers together to coach because there's a lot of uh, not just a lot of games and a lot of runs and a lot of uh, experience there but you know, you've all got coaching uh, capacities in, in various degrees. You had a had a day when you got all the butchers together and you ran a coaching clinic, didn't you? Yeah, we did. We did it at Barnes Cricket Club outdoors. It was a gorgeous day in uh, in July, and it, it went it went really well. So so Mark did his uh, Mark did his Sky TV bit, his roving report a bit, you know, sort of um, anchored the whole lot. And then myself, Alan, and then Gary put on uh, different types of uh, sort of specialist coaching, like, let's master classes for want of a 
better word. Um, and it and it went down went down really well. And, and one of the reasons for putting that on was a to to get us together for the first time to uh, to sort of talk and chat through various things um, related to to batting and bowling. Uh, but it was also trying to showcase ourselves as coaches and and try to get something to come off the back of it as far as a facility was concerned. And and it and it was off the back of that. Someone someone contacted me and said, "Have you have you heard about the Westway Centre? Go and have a look at it." So the idea was 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 a good one and and it had a direct result as well so hopefully you know that can come to fruition a bit later on but it was a it was a really good day and it was great to have uh, all four of us and the whole family turned up every everybody turned up to watch so that no, really it was a really good day yeah so on that day when you you first get that uh, retractable roof going over the nets down there at the west way will the other butchers be down there with you it'll be nice it'll be nice i know that alan he he's seen the video and, and likes it um i've sent it to mark he's obviously out well was out in new zealand i don't know whether he's on his way back now or still on the golf course out there <laughs> uh he was working for uh, he was working for sky tv covering the under 19 world cup yeah so um i'll i'll wait to hear from him so yeah and gary's seen it it'll be it'll be really nice to have a few people down there and I'll, I'll obviously try and put uh, try and put something on trying to get into their busy lives somewhere to see whether we can find a date but um yeah that that would be nice and to have one or two ex uh, ex colleagues and whatever down there just to uh, just to send send the whole thing uh, off in in grand fashion would be a would be a great day yeah well, Ian, it's, it does look like a really exciting project. I'll, uh, I'll I'll spread try and spread the word as much as I can with the video and everything with the Cricket Badger Radio Show podcast. But thank you very much for uh, being a guest on the show this week and every success with that project. Thank you very much. No, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And uh, as I say, hopefully, uh, hopefully it will resonate with with some people out there listening to this. So that will be uh, that will be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we're going to be throwing the Cricket Badger. Quick questions and Northamptonshire all rounder Rob Keogh. It's that Badger style. If you weren't a cricketer, Rob, what would you have done? Oh, that is a tough one. Uh, a fireman, probably. Who's been the biggest influence on your career? Uh, David Sales. Who was your cricket hero as a child? Ricky Ponting. What's the best moment you've had in cricket? Hitting the winning runs in the T20 uh, final at uh, Edgbaston 2016. What's the worst moment you've had in cricket? Oh, pair, probably. Oh, I've only you, had one. Pair. You've only had one, um, right? Yeah, against Warwick, yes. Yeah. So that still haunts you. Yeah. If you could trade lives with any current cricketer for a day, who would it be? Kumar Sangakar. He's that good, isn't he? Yeah. In charge of cricket for a day, what would you change? <laughs> 90 overs. It's got to be less. It's uh, long days when you're in the field. Who's the best player you've ever played against? Oh, that is tough. Sangakar, uh, again, he's up there. Um, Steve Smith, I'm trying to play. I'm trying to think who I've played against. Oh, yeah, we'll stick with those two for now. Who's the best player you've played with? <laughs> Afridi. If you could meet anyone, living or dead, who would you meet? Oh, do, 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 do. I'm going to say... You have to. If you won the lottery, what's the first thing you'd do? Uh, pay off mum and dad's mortgage and get them in the house. Who would you have play you in the movie about your life? Ryan Gosling. What's the first memory you have of being really excited? I think football training at school when I was just first started. What's the first thing you bought when you got your own money? Oh, probably a packet of crisps or a Mars bar. <laughs> What's the last time you found yourself being really nervous? Uh, probably... That finals day, when uh, when Crookie had just run himself out and uh, I saw the big man Rory walking in, I'd have to say then. What would be top of your bucket list? Ooh, Miami Strip. Are you a morning or a night person? Night. What celebrity annoys you the most? Jenna Collins. On a scale of 1 to 10, how cool are you? Oh, 7. If your plane was about to crash, who would you want sitting in the seat next to you? Uh, Michelle Keegan. If you had access to a time machine, where and when would you go? Cool. Uh, I'd have to say I'd go back to Vegas and in the future, I think, maybe 200 years' time. How do you like your steak cooked? Medium. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Miami. One thing you would change about yourself? Oh. There's a few things, I think. I can't list them all. <laughs> and this is the last one. What will you be doing in 10 years' time? Oh, 
hopefully, uh, hopefully teaching my little boy how to play football cricket if I have one, that is. It's that Badger style. Finally this week on the Cricket Budgie Radio Show, former Sussex bowler Lewis Hatchett about his six-year career as a professional cricketer, playing through the pain barrier, having to retire early, and how he's motivated others since that retirement. Lewis Hatchett, and welcome to the Cricket Budget Radio Show podcast. Pleasure to speak to you. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Your, your story really does, I think, inspire and interest quite a few people. Um, obviously, born with Poland syndrome. Just talk us through what that actually means, because it's something I'd not heard of. Until I heard your story in cricket, I'd never heard of Poland syndrome. Yeah, well, it's, it's fairly rare, to be fair. The, the condition itself, it's about one in 100,000. It mainly affects uh, men, uh, and it particularly affects the right side of the body. Um, I think a fairly notable person who's had it in the in the past was Jeremy Beadle, the ex-TV presenter. Um, uh, he had it, uh, but the condition itself can affect people in a few different ways. Some people can have hand deformities. Jeremy Beadle had that. Um, but for me, it means that I'm missing my right pectoral muscle uh, and where that is uh, directly behind it, uh, the two ribs that are meant to be behind it as well. So fairly vulnerable on the right side of my body. But yeah, it's, it, there's no real cause to it. There's no real reason why it just happens. Uh, it's just completely random. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's pretty pretty rare, one in a hundred thousand. It makes me sound a bit like a stalker, but I've seen the picture of you with your top off, and that, <laughs> that, that, that side of your body is kind of a little bit more concave than a, in inverted commas, normal male yeah. body. You, you mentioned the word vulnerable there. I mean, you're a left-handed batsman as well, so that that part of your body is literally facing the bowler. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I kind of grew up knowing that I was pretty vulnerable there. I'd wear like a chest guard that you could get off the shelf. But once I eventually got to professional level, stupidly, I, I got probably to my, my second year. And I, and I thought, well, oh, crikey, they're bowling a little bit quicker now. And I, I think I, I think it was genuinely against Sean Tate was playing in a game. And I was in Australia as well. And I was like, okay, okay I'm going to need something a little bit more, a little bit more serious here. And, and I actually ended up getting... Um, a Kevlar chest guard made so it's, it's bulletproof and it was it made it a lot safer for me to bat but it put my mind at ease that if I was to get hit it was just going to make sure it wasn't going to kill me to start with but um, it still wind me every now and then but it was just uh, it just put my mind at ease knowing that I was that little bit safer um, when I was batting because that that is particularly when I'm most vulnerable batting. Um, I can kind of obviously try and catch the ball, feel the ball when, when I'm out in the field. It's not coming as quick and you're not that close. But, but yeah, that was, uh, that's probably the most vulnerable part of, uh, of cricket that my condition gives me. What, what would be the repercussions if Sean Tate had come in and you hadn't had any protection on at all and he bowled a short ball and it hits you right in that right, um, right hand side of your body? What would be the repercussions of that? Well, it's hitting lung basically. That, that's from a, it could be anything, it would depend how it hit me. Would be from a slight wind into potentially killing me. So, so yeah, it was. I, I became pretty aware of that, and I think a couple of my teammates around the time were like, "Yeah, Lou, you need to, you need to, <laughs> need to probably think about getting something a little more serious here." So, like I said, I, got, I had that that guard made, and, and it put my mind at ease massively towards when I was playing in my professional career. Obviously, I mean, your story to me is a is an instance of sort of triumph and hard work over adversity. It, it's not an easy route into professional cricket for anybody, but with that Poland syndrome, you've Presumably had to work harder, train harder, be a little bit more stubborn than most people. Sort of looking back now, I definitely knew I was. I think at the time it's really hard to say, oh, you're working harder. I kind of set the level of how hard I needed to work. I knew I knew I had to work harder than everyone else because physically it was going to be harder. Um, so whatever people were doing, I was having to do that a little bit more. But it, it, it I definitely look back now and think, oh, no, I was I was putting in a lot more effort. And, and now I actually think, like, well, why wasn't everyone else putting in why, why can why can't anyone put in that that amount of effort really but and see where they can get to because if i can kind of achieve what i achieve then then others can achieve so much more but yeah it, it was it was definitely an interesting road really and and the uh and the amount of work i had to put in i think definitely physically because that was just that little bit is cricket is a really physical sport especially bowling so for me it was always going to be a, an uphill an uphill battle but i managed to uh managed to find a way really wouldn't it have been far easier to have been an accountant? <laughs> it wouldn't have been as much fun, that's for sure. <laughs> I absolutely loved my job. I actually loved it. It was nothing better in the world to go around travelling the world and seeing sunny places and playing some cricket and, and doing something that you love doing. So, no, if anyone had told the 15-year-old kid who had a dream of becoming a cricketer 
that he would become a cricketer. I'd beaten your arm off because that was exactly what I wanted. And uh, I set myself out to go and get it, and, mm. and I did. Well, were there people telling that 15-year-old, you know, this, this is this is daft, Lewis. Why, why, why aren't you trying something else? Because you're never going to become a cricketer with that, that condition. Well, do you know what? I never re- – because I hit it so well. <laughs> I really didn't really make an issue out of it. But growing up, I never – I never made it something for people to target, and and I never gave people my condition a reason to drop me in cricket. I always put myself forward to do um, to do jobs and and actually just be like everyone else. So there was never really someone telling me no, don't do like don't do this because of your condition. I think for me it was more looking around and realizing that there were other people being spoken of better than me. So there were kids that were being told they were more talented, they were better at this you no know, batting, bowling, whatever it may be, I saw them being spoken about in that light and it wasn't me. So you kind of put that, those words in your head. But for me, I just constantly told myself this story of how cool it would be if I actually became a cricketer with this condition, like it'd be pretty cool. Um, and also that being my dream, like that was what I wanted to do and that was what motivated me enough to, to keep going. I've heard you you interview before and you, you've talked about phoning up coaches to try and get mm. into the Sussex team and to you know put yourself forward and everything like that. So presumably, I mean, that, that's an instance of you being, you know, trying to get ahead of the game and trying to put yourself forward. But presumably the, the coaching staff knew of your condition and knew what the repercussions might have been if you'd been hit in the wrong place. And Yeah, I, I think they did. I mean, like I said, I, I didn't give them the opportunity to use it against me I just got on with what I want to do I tried to excel in other areas so I tried to make sure that my cricket was the reason I was getting picked um, and I wasn't getting dropped for I could accept being dropped for cricket reasons if my skill level wasn't good enough but I couldn't accept someone turning me and going your body is not good enough sort of thing and you're getting in so I made myself fitter than everyone else and, and I excelled in that area um, so that my cricket was the next thing I could work on so that that was what I was judged on and yeah that was that was my, my way of thinking for that really you, You've obviously got the batting side of it but as a bowler your, your body is slightly imbalanced isn't it so as a bowler you yeah. had to work on your action to compensate Yeah I had to find my way really to to how I want it so my front arm my right arm is my weakest arm that's where my condition is affected so for me to actually get my right arm up above my head uh, as a leading arm as a bowler was quite challenging. I'd get a lot of um, fatigue in my right shoulder because that was what was doing all the work compared to this huge chest muscle that is pushing your shoulder forward and, and really holding your shoulder in, in position. So for me, I had to find my own way. And uh, that kind of changed over the years, really. Uh, whatever technical points I could take from any coaches, players I was playing with and see what they were doing, I kind of molded my own way of doing it. And I would sort of go away off on my own and, and try something, see if it worked, come back and then and then keep going with it and, and and annoyingly I kind of got to the point where I was yeah 26 having played six years at Sussex and, and I'd really found my action I think and and I was so confident in what I was doing and then unfortunately my injury comes along and, um, and ended my career but I was that's that's kind of all the way up to then I'd, I'd been every bowler tinkers every year they kind of try something new whether it be big small there'll always be some adaptation and changing things but for me it was uh, I, I couldn't stick to the letter of what everyone else was doing because I knew my body was different, so I had to find my own way. And I think everyone does in, in general. Like That's not just because of my condition. I think everyone should have that, that outlook. They should be finding their own way. There's no way you can try and bowl exactly like Jimmy Anderson or exactly like Dale Stane. Like, you should, everyone will have their own way of doing it. Everyone, everyone's action is different. Um, if it was that easy to bowl exactly like Jimmy Anderson and Dale Stane, they, oh, they wouldn't be as special as they are. Who knows <laughs> <laughs> Cricket Badger will be in Barbados in March and you can get involved with a bit of Calypso, Caribbean action. Get your business in front of the cricket world. Sponsor, advertise on the Cricket Badger Radio Show podcast through the two weeks in the Caribbean. It's obviously exciting for me, but we can make it work for you too. Contact cricketbadger at hotmail.com and we can get your business right in front and centre of the world of cricket. Basically, I'm reading a, a piece on the on the internet as a, as you're speaking, and it said that you were advised as a youngster not to play contact sport. Is is that yeah. is that an instance of you being stubborn and saying, "Right, I'm going to prove you wrong"? Well, yeah, I I, I literally 
regard rugby as that only sport that I was allowed to do. That was the only sport I haven't played, really. And cricket was never... My parents never stopped me from playing cricket. So I don't think... I don't know if they really saw it as a contact sport. I had a younger... I've got a younger brother, and he's only you know, a year younger than me, and he's fully able-bodied, so we completely competed equally in the garden. And, and it was just as simple as, I want to beat my brother in the garden, and then he just grew from that and then um, into playing at club level and then trying to get onto the county side. And then, like, like you said, I'm, I'm trying to fought my way into the county setup. And you played a lot of your career with, with pain. As a result of your situation, you, you'd come off the field at the end of the day, maybe not quite as uh, get tired like everybody else, but maybe a little bit more than that. Yeah, I, again, it's really hard to tell what everyone else is going through because I think, when, especially when I was at Sussex, the, you're looking around after a four-day game and, and every bowler is, is just creaking and, and everyone's in, in agony really because it is, it is brutal on your body but I think I definitely I, I know I had different pains than everyone else I mean my shoulder I can't really go a day without having a headache um, on, on my right side so that's just due to the overactive muscles in my right shoulder just compensating for all the work that I'm doing and yeah like neck spasms would be quite common just because again there's all these muscles around my shoulders that are, are really imbalanced and compensating I do so much work to to get them back I think that's where sort of going back to what we were saying earlier about how much work I had to do that's where I really had to work harder was on sort of the the remedial stuff for my body and um, getting it back to to neutral to, to go again and and you never play cricket 100% that was a big learner for me like you you no person will be playing professional cricket at 100% it's how you can kind of deal with all those aches and pains and just get the job done but yeah I did I did have uh, a few more aches and pains. The imbalance of my body, uh, especially sort of in my back, and which is what ended my career, but especially my back and shoulders, that's where I, I really feel a bit of a difference. But I, I found ways to to make sure that I, my body w- was going to be okay and I could heal it, recover. Um, took up yoga like, three years ago, and that was for me was really changed everything. And um, so much so that I'm, I'm going to. I'm shooting off to become a yoga and qualified yoga instructor pretty soon. So, yeah, that's, that's exciting. You, you play, as you say, six years for Sussex. You're born in Shuram by the Sea, so you're a local mm. boy. You, you're living your dream, and then you get that, that injury which curtails your career. I guess, I mean, a lot of people at the age of 26 would think, well, that's, that's the end of the world. Are, are you in that situation, or because of the fact that you've, you've triumphed and, and actually managed to have six years at Sussex, does that maybe alleviate some of that heartbreak? Uh, no, not really. I, I think I think it's um, I think every cricketer. I, I funny enough had this conversation with someone yesterday that um, if every cricketer and any any sportsman, I get, I'm pretty certain will go through a period of whether it be their own choosing to to um, to end their career or whether it was taken away from them. You have this sense of uh, loss of identity. Really, that's really hard to take because you. You have become a cricketer for so long, or a sportsman, and and I know even when it was it was the worst case scenario happened for me, and my career was ripped away for injury. Uh, the next sort of six months, you're I was actually really scared of people asking me what are you up to because the the answer to that question used to be so easy. It just used to be a case of I'm playing cricket, I'm training yeah. for cricket, I'm doing this, that, and the other. Um, and now it was like, oh well, actually I'm not a cricketer. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed to say what I'm going to be doing. But like I said, you have this loss of identity. Uh, for me, I, I kind of knew, I don't know whether it's subconsciously or consciously, that I, I kind of knew my career would potentially end for injury because of my condition. I knew it was a big chance um, just because to, to see how long my body would last. So I was pretty proactive at, at setting myself up for after cricket. Um, fortunately, when I came out of cricket, my brother had just set a business up and needed someone to come in. So I had an opportunity to go in there. I met some incredible people. Um, actually ended up to the point where I, I didn't, uh, the role that I was doing there it was a sales type role and I figured out I wasn't a salesman and someone came to me and said why, why don't you go and speak about your condition you have this um, incredible story um, and I started to really realize how incredible it was more time went on after my career actually when I, what I went through wasn't normal and what I did wasn't the norm um, and I maybe I, I should go out there and speak about it and, and so that's that's kind of where I'm going now I want to be out there helping whether it be other athletes, anyone in the world really who is uh, who, who wants to achieve something uh, and use my story as a as a way of sort of saying anything can be done, just merely putting your mind to it. Um, and and yeah, I alluded to that yoga was something that I did, and I want an idea I want is is based around yoga, and um, and that that's that's something personal to me really. It's sort of like something I've I've always wanted to do. So 
I've got lots of things going on now, uh, which is exciting. And um, I think you just have to, <laughs> I think I just kind of got prepared for the worst really throughout my career. You, me- you mentioned earlier that you, you wonder why some of the other players maybe didn't try and didn't work as, as hard as you did. Um, they didn't have that reason that you had. But is, is that part of your, your chat that, you know, m- yeah, maybe just kind of rinse out every single last effort and last ounce of talent. I think it's really, for me, realising what you do have rather than what you don't have. Uh, I think genuinely, as human beings, we always look at like what we don't have, but really looking at what we do. And for me, I, I, I could have sat there and gone, OK, I don't have a chest muscle. I shouldn't really be playing this sport. It's pretty dangerous for me. But right, what do I have? OK, I'm a left arm bowler. I can swing the ball. That's quite rare. That's my sort of USP. And I found that and I, that's what I clung to. And um, I, I fundamentally... In my mind, I wanted to be the best left arm bowler in the world, and if not, I probably thought I was. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but that was the mindset I had, yeah. and that that got me to where I wanted to be. I always saw if I saw another left arm, I go, I'm better than them, I'm better than them, I'm better than them. And stats and will prove me wrong massively, and they probably were better. I can't sit there and go, Mitchell Stark is not the best left arm bowler in the world. He's um, unbelievable. But um, but that would give me the mindset to just keep pushing for my dream, which was merely to be a professional cricketer and 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 get there and that was kind of like I said that's the mindset I had and using everything that I I knew I had and all the strengths I I saw or other people saw in me um, rather than focusing on all the things that I didn't have Um, and that that like I said that can go into anything in life whether it be an office job or um, a hobby or any sort of thing that people want in their lives Um, that's that's that was my my take on it. I'd imagine, Lewis, you, since you've been doing your motivational speaking, you've met some quite remarkable people. I, I, would, I would think. What, what, what's been your experience of doing that? Has it been a, a really fulfilling role that you've taken on? Yeah, I, I, I loved it. I, I really enjoy working with um, younger people, kind of around. Uh, well, I, do you know what I said? I wouldn't do uh, primary schools, and I went to a primary school recently, and I absolutely loved it. Kids coming up to me, hugging after it's an amazing feeling, uh, and then to hear from like the teachers and the kids after. And what they took out of it, it, it really is fulfilling. I mean, it, uh, it can be quite terrifying sometimes, but after it's so much, it's so worth it. But yeah, I've met some incredible people. I think he, one of the standout things for me was when I, I was able to go and meet some of the um, Paralympian swimmers up in Manchester, and I got to speak to them and, and see what they they did. And it was really weird. It was it was one of the first times I'd felt really comfortable around um, people talking about my condition because they they all have their own conditions and and things and challenges for themselves. So. Um, so yeah, it, it is it, it is really fulfilling, and I think I've kind of niched myself at the moment because I'm 27 years old. I'm not a 40, 50 year old guy who's kind of experienced everything in life. I'm at that level of younger people, um, and I I can kind of connect in that way. And I think that's what people have seen so far is that I'm able to connect with people sort of on their level, especially a younger generation. Um, just due to my age, and but the experiences I've, I've had have been quite unique, um, and I can get those across them. Just finally, Lewis, if you could go back and relive one day of your your six years at Sussex, oh. which one would you take? What was your what's your best memory of playing cricket? Oh, I, I tell you what, like the it was terrifying, but the first day I ever my f- debut really it was terrifying because um, it was such an incredible game. Oh, there's so many actually, but yeah, that 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 that, that feeling of of that getting your cap and um, and finally realising that I'd, I was playing a fully first-class game for Sussex was uh, an amazing achievement. And then again, that, that game was, uh, it was like 15 international players playing in that game. So it was quite an amazing game. And opening the bowling against uh, Andrew Strauss, who was captain of England at the time. So that was an amazing experience. And then there's things like the day I got my contract, that again really stands out for me. Uh, and then I played against Australia. That was That was a great game of cricket for three days when they came and toured over here. But yeah, there's nothing really I would I regret at all. Um, I always look and say everything that happened happened that way and couldn't have happened any other. But yeah, it's, uh, it's it was an amazing amazing journey. It's, it's a fascinating story and, and one which uh, I think a lot of people are interested in. And uh, thank you very very much for coming on. No problem. Thanks, James. Thank you very much. It's that Badger style. I think you'll agree it's been a very special edition of the Cricket Budget Radio Show podcast this week. Thank you to Ian Butcher, to Rob Keogh and for Lewis Hatchett for their time. We'll be back again next week. So join us then for the Cricket Badger Radio Show podcast. Thank you so much for your support that you've shown for the Cricket Badger Radio Show podcast. Contact the show. It is for you after all. You're the audience. 
Tell us what you think. Tell us what you'd like to see in the future. Have your say. That's cricket underscore badger on the Twitter feed. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay tuned. More to come through 2018 on the Cricket Budget Radio Show Podcast. It's that Badger style.